Amen. He didn't have to call us one of his. He didn't have to adopt us. He didn't have to make his blood available for us. But God is a loving God, a faithful God. Amen. And it is an honor to serve God. And sometimes we forget, get about that. We get so used to the blessings of God and, and the things that God is doing, we forget that there are times where we will run into opposition, but it's an honor to serve God. Amen. It's an honor to go through the valley with him. It's an honor to go through the night season and have the Lord bring you out the other side. Amen. Praise God to know that he cares and knows our name. Amen. We're going to start, um, I, I don't know if it's a series or not, it'll probably be at least two weeks on relationships. And again, I don't really know how far it's going to go. I just know that the Lord gave me a bunch of notes a couple days ago on this and kept impressing upon me. So we're going to launch into this today. We're going to endeavor to talk about relationships for at least two, probably three weeks and see what the Lord does. But let's read these scriptures here in Genesis 2.18. We're going to go right across what you see there on the overhead on the slide starting at Genesis 2.18. Try to bring some things out. And today will probably be more of a foundation for the things that we'll talk about in the next lesson or the next lessons that are following that. So Genesis 2.18 and the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Amen. A helpmeet. It's not good for man to be alone. Mark 12, 29, going into the New Testament. Familiar scripture to us. We usually refer, refer to it in, in terms of the oneness of God and, and the great two commandments, but the commandments are relational. The commandments are relational to God. God's commands are relational, but sometimes we lose sight of that. So Mark 12 and 29, and Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There's none other commandments greater than these. And again, even in the Old Testament, if you go to Leviticus 19 and 18, it says that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So oftentimes people erroneously think that the law didn't have any love or any grace, but the law was based on love. The law that God gave Moses, for his people, was based on love that he's delivering them. He wants them to keep their deliverance in a world that they are living in. So the things that he gave them were based on what he knew they would need to stay separate as his people, to stay delivered as his people. So God will give us laws. It's, just, it's the same thing that we do with, with children, okay? We draw parameters around them based on what we know they need in the situation they're in. It doesn't mean we don't love them. The child feels like, you don't love me. How come I can't do that? Why can't I go here? But we do that based on our knowledge of the bigger picture and who that child is. So God does the same thing with us. 1 Corinthians 15 and 33 1 Corinthians 15, 33, again, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. And we'll try to tie these scriptures all together, because some of them you may say, well, how does that fit in what he's talking about? And then finally, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of 
peace. Again, sometimes people have the ideas. Sometimes we maybe even kind of promote the idea unconsciously that once you're saved, it's going to be automatic uni unity. But the Bible says endeavoring. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Sometimes you've got to work to keep unity. Sometimes you've got to work on yourself <laughs> to keep unity. Amen. The problem often, oftentimes is, is more ourselves than others. They may be wrong, but it's the way we're handling what they're doing that can be the problem. Okay? Amen. So relationships. These are all related to relationships. So man is created as a relational being. It's very important we understand that. So the Lord made Adam with relational needs. We read that. It's not good that man should be alone. I will make for him a help meet. So God designed man with relational needs for a mate, for the purpose of family, and for the purpose of relating to God. God made us relational beings so that we can relate to him. Really, and God's ultimate plan is that we can be relating to him. Sons of God. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Why does God want to redeem man? Because God made man to relate to him. When it says in the book of Revelation, he that overcometh, will I grant to sit down with me in my throne? That's not an afterthought. That's a pre-purposed thought that God had before the foundation of the world. He wants to bring some sons to glory, or many sons, as the book of Hebrews says, okay? So God, God has created man as a relational being. Not only so we can have a relationship down here, but so that we can relate to him. He wants us to relate to him. Amen. And there's no greater relationship than that. But it, we're not trying to minimize human relationships. God made it so we could have human relationships. So now notice, when God says to Adam, it's not good that man should be alone, Adam is not absolutely alone, is he? You've got all the animals. God's been bringing them to him. The animals are not hostile. So anything could be a pet, an alligator, a lion, or a dog. He's not worried about that. And God is there. God's talking to him. But even with God there and animals, God designed us so that there's another relational need that we have between people. Amen? Amen. So when we talk about relationship, how important this is, relationship is the basis for society. You can't have a society that doesn't have some agreement for relationship. Right? There's got to be some common connection to make a society. That's why there's countries, there's common connections of the groups of people that are within that. They may go back a long time. They may be weak today. But that's what society is. So society is, is relationship is the basis for society. The family, husband, wife relationship. Family is based on that husband, wife relationship. And so when we go back to the book of Genesis, again, chapter 2, and we look here, we see that family is all really the basis for society. Good families, good societies. Bad families, bad societies. Amen. So God says here in, in Genesis 2.23, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman and brought her onto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So what you see here is you see that family is the basis for relationship. The strength of family is, is strong enough that children will grow up and leave 
their regular family and go start another family. We also see that within the family, its intimacy is supposed to be a part of that. They're both naked, and they're not ashamed. Okay, And intimacy is not limited to the physical, but the point I think that the Bible is trying to make there, part of the point is, is if they were not ashamed to be intimate physically, they shouldn't be ashamed to be intimate emotionally. All right? And so a lot of times people are ashamed to be intimately, intimate physically. That's why they need to get high or drunk or got to be a special thing. And, and it usually is signifying or, or indicating another element of something that needs to be dealt with. Amen. So family is the basis for society. Family is the basis for city. Family is the basis for a country. We go to Genesis chapter 10. And, and the Bible tells us here that after the flood, it tells us how out of Noah's family, the whole world is populated. Out of Noah's family, Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives, out of eight people, it, it describes how the world is initially populated after the flood, showing us that from family comes society. Amen? So we're not going to read all of Genesis 10, but you can look at it and it says, verse 1, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and after them, and unto the sons that were born unto them after the flood. And so it goes out in Chronicles, you know, these were the sons of Japheth, and this is where they went. These are the sons of Shem, this is where they went. These are the sons of Ham, this is where they went. And this is how the world was populated. So we have right out of the Bible, the Bible's telling us that the basis for society is family. Because from Noah's family came a thing that was going to repopulate the world after the flood. And we could go to Genesis chapter 5 and do a similar thing with Adam and Eve and all that. But I think it's better to do it with Noah. Because that links us to where we are today. So relationships, the basis for society, the characters of an area were related, are, are or were, or were related to family when we look in the Bible. So again, when we start to analyze Genesis chapter 10, we start to see that where Ham's descendants settled, those people seem to have a similar characteristic. Okay, where Shem's people inhabited, they had a, a similar characteristic. Okay, where, where Japheth's people, this, you know, inhabited that area, you see similar characteristics. So we're only going to bring out uh, Ham's side because it, it gives us more detail than the other ones, and the other ones out of history. Of course, you can do Shem's side by reading the rest of the Bible, too. You get an idea of that because God has given the promise through the line of Shem, when Noah prophesies, okay? But the characteristics of an area, okay? So when we see in Genesis 9 and 20, we see it says, that, And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncut within his tent. And Ham the father in and saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a, a garment, and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness, and Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son done unto him, and Canaan became, or not Canaan, but yeah, Canaan becomes cursed because of that. So the point is here, we don't know exactly what happened here, but there is an intimate intimation of something sexual going on here and for sure the Bible lets us understand that the nakedness of somebody of their parents is a personal thing that was one of the things in the law thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of your daughter your stepdaughter and so forth it goes on and on and on because that has to do with reproduction sexuality is not just for pleasure but it is for the family, it is to be done within the family, 
and it's there to help solidify the bond between the husband and wife to make a good family. So a disrespect for what sexuality stands for and also the authority of Noah as his father brought a curse upon him. So now when we go and we look at the, the descendants of Ham, we see similar characteristics coming out. Nimrod. Nimrod is the founder of Babylon. Nimrod becomes a great and mighty hunter before the Lord. And if you research that historically, you find out that also means a hunter of the souls of men. It's not just a hunter of animals, but it's also the hunter of souls of men. And this was an epithet that also went to the kings of Assyria. You can find this in some Bible encyclopedias. Well, Nimrod is the founder of Assyria, too. Also out of Babel and Erech comes Assyria and Nineveh. So we see that rebellion or a disrespectful attitude starts to embody this area where Canaan's or Ham's children start to descend. Canaan starts to found, he founds Sidon, which becomes Tyre and all these other places. But Canaan's area is also the area where Sodom and Gomorrah are. And we see later on when Abraham's seed comes back out of Egypt after the children of Israel 400 years down there, it's because the iniquity of the Amorites has come to fall and they're being judged and they are descendants of Canaan. Okay, so there's a greater, there's, there's a problem with how sexuality is handed, Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, there's a problem with how things are looked at. And the point we're trying to make is families that settle an area affect the character of an area. That's why it makes a difference what a family believes and teaches and lives. That's why this country was different, because the families that originally settled here had a different view of what life should be about. They believed the Bible ought to be the basis. Now, it took them a while to work some of the things out, but in the end, the country was formed that people are still trying to come to. You hear people on, on the news saying, that, you know, we're so terrible, we got this problem, and we've got this systemic attitude, you know, built into us. And, and yeah, we're not perfect. And there's a lot of sins in this country, but there's less here than others up to this point. And if it's so bad, why are people still coming? Amen. And so my point is, again, is families... The family is the basis for society. Good families make good society, good society makes good cities, makes good country, makes a good world. Amen. Again, that's the, re that's the reason the only thing that's going to help this country is a revival. Because we got things going on in families that only God can fix. Sin is, a, is the basic problem, okay? Amen. So we can look at that. The Egyptians were descendants of Ham. And again, we know that the Egyptians, if some, some accounts say they have a million gods, a million different gods. Well, if you've got a million gods, nobody even knows what they all are except maybe the priests. You don't have, you don't have enough. If you do 10 a day, you don't have enough to get through them in a year. A million gods. They had all these gods, but they didn't really know the true God. God gave them an opportunity, amen, with, with the children of Israel and the ten plagues. But my, my, point, my point is, again, what I'm trying to say is families determine society, and the Bible illustrates it. Okay, when we say things, we want to have a foundation in the Bible. Amen. So man's created as a relational being. It's the basis for society. Family is the basis of the church. Good families, good church. Bad families, bad church. Problem families, 
problem church. Amen? Now, church is designed to deal with problems. And as long as we live down here, we don't get away from problems. But if we've got people that believe God, are seeking God, trust God, will humble themselves under God's hands, God will give us the grace and the wisdom and the means to deal with all the problems. I hope you believe that. <laughs> I believe it. Amen. So family affects each generation, as we saw. So we go back to Exodus 20. This is why God is, the Lord is giving some of the reasons, the commandments that he gives. In Exodus 20, he talks about idolatry. Why, why is God so strict on idolatry? The whole world knew the true God in the beginning. In Adam and Eve's day, they knew God personally. Cain and Abel knew who God was. Cain had God talk to him. Amen. And others could find him. Enoch walked with God. And he was not because he pleased God. So people were able to find God if they wanted him. God talked to Noah. So God's not unknown. And after the flood, those that come through the flood all know something about the true God. They all know something, and some of them have actually talked with God. But yet, even with that true knowledge, people slide off into idolatry. So God makes some laws, and in Exodus, when he gives the commandments, he says in Exodus 20 and 2, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness, or anything that is in the heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So right there again, God is showing that if the family is godly, blessings are coming. If the family disobeys God, iniquity, curses are coming. He shows it right there. Now, it may not happen immediately, but they're going to happen somewhere down the road. There's a long-term effect. If, you, if I raise up an idol in our house, even if nobody else in the house does, the kids, the rest of the family remembers there's an idol there. And it affects the family. You raise up an idol. You start to serve an idol. It puts a doubt. It puts a doubt. People's life. Look at Gideon. Okay, he's threshing wheat in the wine press. The angel comes to him, oh, if, you know, where is God of our fathers? You got idols in the house, Gideon. Your dad's got an idol. It's affecting my reaction with you. I want to deliver you. You're the one I'm going to use. But the first thing you got to do is throw down the idol. Amen. you got to make sure the idol doesn't have any authority in your life. Praise God. And so when we come to God, a lot of times why people don't succeed in continuing for God is they fail to throw the idols down in their life. So God, God will come to us. He'll reach out to us. We become aware. We're sinners. We become convicted. We need God. We have faith. God gives us a measure of faith. We reach out. We repent. God saves us, fills us with the Holy Ghost. We obey God. But we've got to throw the idols down. And if you don't throw the idols down sooner or later, there comes a day where you bow to one of those idols in a moment of weakness. And so we're just trying to say here that it shows the family. What happens in the family affects society. That's why this idea that, well, everybody can just do their own thing and it doesn't matter who's a mother or who's a father or what the relationship is, is a bunch of garbage. Because it does matter what happens in the family. Amen. 
Looking at Psalm 78, 5 and 7. Psalm 78, verses 5 through 7. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So, Raising the family properly creates a testimony. We, if we're living for God, we've got a testimony. We pass that to our children. We pass it to our children so they can pass it to their children. Testimony passed down, you got, you got a godly generation. No testimony passed down, then the next generation is going to have problems. When you study revivals, in the move of God. The problem is always in the generation following the revival. If the children don't get what the, what the previous generation got in the revival, they will drift away. So it happened here in New England and Plymouth. They were fine until the second generation, but then the generation that grew up here didn't come here out of conviction. They just grew up here. They didn't know the things that their parents endured in order to have what they got. And so they, they, nobody was, they weren't coming in to the church with a testimony. And so now the church was full of people that didn't believe. They're just going. It's rules. It's tradition. My mom and dad did. I've been raised that way. Those are good words, but I don't know why. Amen. And that's one of the reasons why we got to live right ourselves so that we can live in a way that we can pass something on to our kids. There's got to be enough in us that says, I'm going to live for God first. There's got to be enough in us that's willing to, for us to give some things up in order to have the fire of God in our lives so it can be passed on to the children, the generation to come. Amen. And I look at churches across New England, not having grown up here, but being, being here 40 years and seeing people grow up in the church. And what I see often is the generation of the ones that were saved since I've been here, the kids did not get it. For whatever reasons. So my point is, our relationships are important. And one of the purposes of the family, the godly family, is to pass on to the generation to come what God has given us. And the idea that, you know, we'll just bring them and they'll just catch it and they'll learn it. No, they, there's, there's got to be something that, that they've got to see in us. Amen. There's got to be something that they see in us that's, that's more than we just go to church on Sunday. Or read our Bible once in a while. You listen to people that, that have come through that, were, that, that grew up under parents that were in great revivals, like Azusa Street and different things. And they, they talk about prayer meetings in their house, you know, where the woman shook until their hair came down and people being healed and stuff like that. They saw something that passed it on. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Family's the basis of the church. The unity of the church. The unity of the church is, again, this is part of society. The unity of the church is important. So, Ephesians 4 and 1. Again, we're living, we're living in a day and age where people don't understand commitment. They, they, don't, they don't understand that, that sometimes you need to make a commitment to something. 
Marriages fail because they, people don't understand commitment. When they're getting ready to get married, they don't realize when they say, they say those words, they sound nice, until death do us part, and goodness and sickness and better or health or whatever, till death do us part. They haven't really thought about what if my wife is sick for the rest of our marriage? Or my husband? Am I going to stick with it? What if there's more problems than I thought? What if life is, marriage is not all the fun that I thought. There's a lot of work. Commitment says I, I'm going to do what I said. And again, you, today you see it in, in businesses and different things that people hop from job to job and, you know, they'll, they'll change a job just to get a little raise. And sometimes you got to do that. I understand that. But that shouldn't be the norm all over the place. People should be making commitments. And I understand if you're working at a McDonald's, that's not forever. So, you know, that's, that's a temporary thing. Sometimes you're going through places. But there ought to be a place where now, now you're here, and unless something weird happens or out of the ordinary, you, you don't need to be going all over the place. In some countries, they, they change jobs for $10 more a week. We, we had people that did software for us when I was working for Schneider Electric, and one of the problems was you were always retraining the testers on the other side because you get one up to speed, they'd become good, and they'd go someplace else for 10 bucks. Now you got to go through the whole process again. We we're constantly doing that. It actually was costing us more money to do it that way just because by it per hour, it might look like better on paper, but in, in truth, it costs us more to do it that way than to do it here. But that doesn't count when you're just looking at papers and stuff. So, Ephesians 4 and 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity in the bond of the Spirit. Okay, again, families, unity. Society, good families. Family, if a husband and wife are committed to one another, then they're committed to the children. When children feel secure, they grow up healthy. They grow up healthy, they can make commitments and keep them. And so when you have churches with families that are, are committed, you can have unity. Unity is important for the body. Again, if we read Psalm 133, it talks about the anointing flows from the head towards the feet. It talks about how precious it is you know, when, when brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the anointing that was upon Aaron that went down upon his beard and down to his clothes. Well, the, the illustration that, that God is trying to bring out there is Aaron is a type of Christ, the high priest. And in the church, anointing flows from the head, Jesus, to the body, the church. But if that body is not connected to the head, it doesn't matter if I pour a casket of oil on the head, it's not going to reach the body. Right? So this, this is... And so unity is when, when the body is connected to the head the right way. Same thing in the church. And again, we're living in an age where people are often doing their own thing, and, and they might be good, but they don't understand that sometimes when you make a commitment, sometimes you're going to suffer with others for things you didn't do to keep the commitment. Amen? If I, if I join the army and I get out there on the battlefield, I might have to suffer some things because of the unit that I've joined in with those guys. 
And how good that, that soldiers, that, that unit's going to fight depends on the commitment of the people. So we're talking about relationships, okay? So how people work together will be based on a person's family background. So you can get saved and come into church. You get the Holy Ghost. You get delivered from drugs and addiction or a bad lifestyle. But if your environment you've been brought up in, you don't know how to work with people. You don't know how to trust people. That can still be a problem even when you got the Holy Ghost. You don't know how to take orders. You know, so some kids don't know how to stay right in a classroom because they've never had it, their parents expect anything of them at home. So family, family is the basis for healthy relationships. You know, just some of the things that we get when, from the family. We get our name. First and last name. And if you study the Bible, you see that there's destiny in name. And they were talking about names last night. Over at the Nickerson, they were talking about names a little bit there. And as they were talking, I thought about, you know, that a name, you, you should really, I believe parents ought to pray for their name. They shouldn't just give a name out. That's popular. I like that. You better pray because there's destiny in that name. In fact, in part of the destiny depends on the way a person goes, too, because you can look in, in the line, line of Abel or Seth and Cain, you'll see some of the same names. But when you look the names up, you'll find out there's a positive and a negative. If I follow God, here's my destiny. If I follow myself or sin or the devil, here's my destiny. So, so names can point to destiny and identity. Amen. Our role, who I am, male or female, first or last, mother or father or child. We start to learn that just because I am a person and I want things or like certain things or don't, doesn't mean that I can just do it the way I want. I've got a role in the family. Hey, if I learn to do my role good, I can go to work and learn to do my job good. I can function under the boss because I learned how to be in a role in a family. Hallelujah. Amen. Our values, personal value, my personal worth. Am I worth anything? Am I just a number? A lot of that is initially put into us from our families. Good or bad. Right and wrong. What's right and wrong? We learn that. You know, some families, they, they go to church to teach you shouldn't lie. And other families, they go to church you shouldn't lie except it's a white lie. Or, you, or there's a big consequence. So you learn the value of what lie means values values come right and wrong what's important and priorities and oftentimes where we have the biggest problem i think all of us is priorities because we might have the list there of important things god's on the list it's important but he's not the first priority And we may say God is first, but the way we live our life shows he's really not first. And our children catch that. They catch that we say that God is first, or we say God is important. But then they look at the list. Well, God's important except my vacation, my TV show, my sports thing. You know, I'll be in church except on Super Sunday. Again, there's nothing wrong with Super Sunday, but you need to figure out, you know, what, what's really 
important. And sometimes our choices convey our priorities. And this is how children sometimes end up doing something we wish they wouldn't do, even though we took them to church. That's why it doesn't work when you drop your kids off at church most of the time. There are exceptions. If, you know, there's just a kid that God is dealing with them and they're going to come through and they're going to become something great for God. But most of the time, those kids are going to say, okay, I'm being dropped off and the mom and dad don't really think it's that important because they're not here. And then our, our abilities come out of family a lot of times. Talents become highlighted. We become aware. But our character is also formed in a family. I mean, honestly, do you want the world to form the character of your kids? Or do you want you to have the say in that? That's why God made it husband and wife and family. It's the parents' responsibility to see that the character of the children are formed right. Okay, things like courage. Things like being truthful, honest, dependable, kind. Character. This is all in the family. This is why Relationships are important. And we could, you could go into greater depth on all of these things. But again, family is, is the basis for healthy relationships. The responsibility of raising children rests with the parents. Now, that does not mean you can't use daycare. Okay, it doesn't mean that sometimes you've got to do that based on your situation. But even if you use daycare... Or, or whatever you, you know, use when you're not there, the responsibility is still there with you. All right, and we, get, we have instruction from the Bible, Proverbs 22 and 6. And Proverbs 22 and 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, I think, to me, the big error there is when we read that verse, people think, teach a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. It doesn't say teach. It says train. And I'm going to say training includes teaching and demonstration. So that, that's where sometimes, again, families, Christian families fail. Well, we took them to church every Sunday. That's teaching. Now you need to demonstrate with your life that you believe what's being taught at church. There needs to be a demonstration in our lives that we believe the things that God is saying and so when the kids come home from Sunday school, they see us repent sometimes. They see us say, I was wrong sometimes. They see us say, will you forgive me? They see us endeavoring to go to church even when it's difficult. And they see us praying and seeking God even when things are good. Hallelujah. The demonstration of God in our lives impacts our children, greater than Sunday school will by itself.
training is not just teaching, but it's also demonstrating. It's also getting that child to be involved in the principles that they are being taught. If you're going to train somebody to play an instrument, you just can't put up the music. Here's the notes on the staff. This is what they mean. Here, look at this picture. Here's where the notes are. You can do that for, for a year. They won't be able to play anything. They've got to pick that instrument up and play that. Or handwriting. You can give them, have them memorize the whole alphabet. But they've got to write. They've got to write. They've got to read. So it's not just teaching principles. So train up a child. When you train, when you train, you live and demonstrate the things of God in your life. When you are honest with your kids, they will live for God. They will. Hallelujah. Children need correction and guidance, 22 and 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Now, sometimes we look at these things and we think, you know, well, the rod, it doesn't mean you have to go beat your kid with a rod. But it does mean that there sometimes has to be some type of physical correction. Now, let, let's think of this. Jesus lived under that. You think Joseph and Mary were out there beating with a rod his brothers and sisters all the time? I don't think so. Right? We look at them as a good family, right? But yet Jesus was raised under these principles. Amen? So what I'm trying to say is they're not outdated and they're not cruel. But what the Bible is trying to say is the nature of a child needs to be guided to grow properly. You know, one, one person said, you don't have to teach a child how to be selfish. It becomes automatic. What you have to do is teach them how to share. You don't have to teach a child how to lie or, or, or steal something. They'll do that naturally. You've got to teach them how to be honest and tell the truth. So it says that the nature of a child, because we understand that carnal nature, it just wants what it wants at the time it wants it. And growing a child up and, and training them involves guiding them and sometimes disciplining them, letting them understand that's not the right thing to do. And if you do that again, this is what's going to happen. You don't just well off and whack them because they do the wrong thing. That's bad too. But you, you let them know that's not the right thing. This is how you need to do this. This is why. This is the reason. And if you do that again, here's what's going to happen. And if you say that, you better follow through. Because if you don't follow through, they'll realize, oh, it doesn't always happen. Maybe I should take the gamble. Amen. Look how many people take a gamble for just one once in a while. They're all down at Foxwoods. They're all buying lottery tickets. Most of the time they're not winning, but they're willing to take that gamble just for a little bit. That's human nature. It's got to be disciplined. Okay, this is what the Bible's saying. The Bible's saying that our human nature needs to be trained and guided. That's why we have the Word of God. That's why we have the Spirit of God. Amen? Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. Withhold not correction from thy child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Again, I'm not saying take get a rod and start beating your kids every time 
they do something wrong. I'm not saying even do that. What I'm trying to, what the Bible is trying to say is, if you don't correct your child, they're going to go to hell. But if you'll correct them with love, you'll draw limits, you'll set boundaries, you'll let them know this is what this is the right way, and here's what happens if you don't, and you follow through. You will save their soul from hell. Amen. And you know what? What you also teach children, which a lot of kids don't understand today, there's a cause and effect. And you got people that, why do I have to come into work? Why can't I just work from home? Why do I got to come in at nine o'clock? Why can't I come in at ten? Why can't, why, not, why can't I dress the way I want to when I come into work? Why do I got to use that? I got to do this. They, they don't understand anything, anything about, you know, that you've got to do things a certain way. You know, why can't I watch it? Why can't I do this? Why can't I play this? Everybody else is doing it. But you diss them cause and effect. You let them understand that. Listen, when you do some, or, you know, I took stuff from work, and, you know, why am I in trouble? Didn't show up for work. Why are you firing me? They don't understand cause and effect. They don't understand that there's an answer. An answer in their life for what they do. Amen. And how we act around our children can affect them. And this is just, like I said, it's an introduction to some things that the Lord was speaking to me about. 1 Corinthians 15, 53. Usually we apply this as Christians relating to people outside of the church. And it does mean that. But we can also understand it within the family setting, too. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Or how a children, child, or person acts. So how we talk at home. How you talk at home. How you act at home. Because communion is not just words, is it? Much is communicated through action. Right? And so our, our, our speech and our actions can corrupt the thinking of children. And that also means you got to be careful who you let your kids hang around with, too. I mean, the problem is, is kids, kids can come over, they can be nice, but you, you let your kids go to the house, you have no idea what's going on in their house. You have no idea what's going on on the, on, the, on the TV there. You better know before you let them go. Maybe you do have an idea what's going on. So in family and relationships, and we're going to close with this, you know, so we have something, okay, that's positive we can grab onto. Love. Love needs to be the guiding principle in relationships. Love, that's, so it goes back to the first and great two commandments, right? Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love needs to be the guiding principle in all relationships. Now, the problem that some people have, and I say everybody here, is they think love always means being nice. But the Bible says God chastens those whom he loves. So sometimes love means doing, disciplining somebody or handling somebody in a way they will not like. And they may even be mad initially. But if they really want to grow and they want to know God and want to do the right thing, 
you'll realize after the fact you had it coming. Yeah, that was the right thing. So the Bible says in, in Proverbs 10 and 12, talking about love. Love needs to be the guiding principle when we're, when we're dealing with relationships. Love is what, what makes a husband and wife work, right? And the children should be the result of the love between the parent parents. So Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirreth up strife, but love covereth all sins. So even in a godly family, nothing's going to be perfect. Just because you pray every day and you fast regularly and you read your Bible and you're, you're trying to do the will of God and, and you're witnessing does not mean you'll do everything right for people. We're still living in a simple world. And we've still got a sin nature that we've got to deal with. But love will cover that. Love will cover those imperfections. Look over in 1 Peter 4, 4 8. To me, it's a, it's a parallel scripture to the one we just read. Letting us understand that the principle of love didn't really change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's always been there. But 1 Peter 4 and 8, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. It doesn't mean that by love you, you hide sin, but what it means is love will give you what you need to patch up the problems that are the result of sin. To deal with the problems that are the result of sin. Sin, sin will break relationships, but love can repair it. Amen? And so we're, we're talking about relationships here this morning. Just starting out and just laying a foundation, trying to help us understand that relationships are important. They're important to society. They're important to our personal lives. They're important to children. They're important to the generation to come. Amen. And so we need to look at our relationships. We're going to look a little further. Next week we'll have some, something more to say about it. There's other things that I'm not saying that the Lord said, but in order to try to bring it out clearly, it's going to take a little more time. So let's stand here this morning. Aren't you glad we can have a relationship with the Lord? Aren't you glad that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us, and if we've broken relationship, that relationship can be restored by the blood. We confess our faults. He's faithful and just to forgive us. Lord, we praise you here today. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, on this day. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather together, Lord, in your name, Lord God. We ask you, Lord God, to help us see the value of relationship. Lord, help us, Lord, to apply love in our relationships, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to do the right things in our relationships with one another, Lord God, within the church, within society, with our children, Lord God. Lord, we praise you. We thank you that we can do all things through you, Lord, that strengthen us. You'll supply the needs that we have. Lord, we're praying right now for our families and everyone that's here. Lord, under the vo voice, Lord God, and all that are in this congregation. Help us, Lord, in our relationships. Help us, Lord, to be godly, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to seek you, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to put you at the center of the relationships, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to believe that you can work out things and heal things. And the reconciliation, Lord, that works to reconcile us to you can work in our relationships. And we give you the glory and we give you the honor. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Amen. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. God bless you.